Hello, everyone. My name's uh, Tim Duffy. Hello, everyone. My name's Tim Duffy. Uh, this is Civic and Humanitarian Open Source. Uh, a little bit about myself. So uh, kind of by day, I'm a FPGA designer and firmware uh, software person. I uh, work on uh, embedded computing devices that uh, are usually very uh, low power or lower power compared to uh, normal computers today. Uh, and then also, uh, if you ever need a website written or anything like that, I do a, quite a bit of uh, web developer contract work as well. And then in all of the time that's left over after that, uh, I, I'd, I like to consider myself a civic hacker, although uh, after having two children, I am doing it significantly less than I would like, but as, as these things happen. Uh, right, so what's a hacker, in case anyone at this particular conference isn't familiar with that. <laughs> uh, but seriously, right, so, Right, a hacker is someone that likes tinkering, that likes questioning, that likes poking and, and, and understanding, you know, what's right underneath the surface and even deeper. And this is right from Wikipedia, so you can enjoy it yourself uh, later on. But so what is open source? And we talk about that a lot in the world of software because we're standing on each other's shoulders uh, moving forward here. And um, a, a lot of the technologies that we take advantage of every, every day either are open source themselves or they're leveraging a massive open source ecosystem. All of almost all of Android is open source. Almost all of Chrome is open source, Firefox. Um, the computers that control the traffic lights run open source software, right, Linux. Um, it's, it is everywhere and it's very ubiquitous and uh, because it's software, right, if it's not uh, flashy, it's very difficult to identify. So, open source, what is the culture of openness? So uh, free and open source software, FOSS, has always had a culture of openness, not only uh, with sharing code, but also sharing ideas and uh, being, or trying to be inclusive. There are, of course, open source projects, uh, most notably, uh, sometimes makes its way into the news, uh, the Linux kernel project, that are not as open as they could be. But uh, the culture of FOSS, I believe, and I, uh, I find that most people that I speak to that are very tuned into FOSS, uh, believe that it fosters a culture of openness. So civic hacking and open source go together very nicely. And so what is civic hacking? We talked about what is a hacker, what is open source, and that will bring you together. So civic innovation, I think we understand what innovation is, changing things, um, uh, making new, uh, taking, taking existing and uh, bring it to the next level. So civic innovation, and we can read right out, there's a new idea or, methodology, or method that improves the lives of citizens, the functions of cities, the practice of citizenship, or state of community affairs. So this is kind of civic innovation. Uh, and, uh, that's uh, uh, Alex Howard. I highly recommend uh, following him on Twitter there. And so what is civic innovation as implemented by hackers or civic hacking? And uh, I, I really, I really like uh, so Josh Data. He uh, on, on Twitter. He's he, he's had many different roles, and uh, he was in, or he still is in Washington, and uh, is, was very much so a part of uh, uh, DC open source and civic hacking culture. I, I I've met him uh, briefly a few times, and, and an excellent gentleman to speak with at uh, conferences. Um, often, civic hacking involves the use of government data to make governments more accountable but the goals of civic hacking are as diverse as those that call themselves hackers. And really, this drives home uh, a point that is um, 
not immediately obvious when speaking with people that are not technical is that you can be a civic hacker and never write a line of code. Uh, there are data, data, data journalists that are big civic hackers, right? They're consuming information, um, digesting information, and making it more uh, accessible to people. Uh, and so this is, you can do civic hacking, can be programmers, designers, data scientists, even just good communicators, storytellers, as, uh, specifically journalists there. Uh, entrepreneurs to fund the uh, projects that move us forward uh, civically. Uh, government employees and anyone that is willing to get their hands dirty solving things. So these are the kind of the five points that I think about when I think about civic hacking and humanitarian hacking is data liberation. So this is, this is um, right when the state of uh, New York said we're going to have uh, data.ny.gov. We're going to make a uh, repository where we, any entity within the government can now post any amount of data they want to in this nice, easily uh, searchable and, and um, uh, scrollable format, right? So all of a sudden, these organizations come out of nowhere and they're like, oh, well, this is like the number of pencils that we've bought every year, or this is um, this information. In many cases, they're PDFs and they're scanned and they're dirty and they're like at 90 degrees, you know, 40 degrees off. So like, what are you gonna do with that, right? And so that would be data liberation. That could be as simple as someone just going, I, I have a desire to get this particular piece of information and I'm gonna go in, find it, and then publish it or post it on Twitter or whatever it may be, or as far as writing software to actually automatically pull that information out and making it more accessible, indexable, whatever it may be. Data collating, taking information from lots of different places and putting it together into one, uh, one location so you don't, um, you're saying that Yes, all of the information is out there that you need. However, it's going to take you 24 hours of actually looking on the internet to get that. That's, no, no one has time for that. So if one or a small group of people can spend the time to collate all of that information together, now you're reducing the barrier to entry for others to consume that information. And that information can be very, very powerful for changing uh, everything from election results to how towns actually go about spending uh, tax dollars. Data portals and dashboards, this is, um, a lot of times you'll see, uh, like definitely during election season, just because it gets so much uh, press, that the New York Times and other uh, well-funded data organiza or, uh, journalist organizations will have these data portals and dashboards where you can kind of interactive and fill around with things. This uh, generates a lot of user interaction and allows people to think a little bit more about what the data actually means and what, uh, what of the data that is being presented is important to them, especially if there's a, 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 a user interaction involved. Infographics, these are really, oh no. Infographics, these are really great for uh, social media, right? So you can just share them really quick. We see them all the time. Oh, you know, cat picture, you know, kid in turtle outfit, whatever. And infographic about something really important about my town. And you hopefully don't just keep scrolling down. But that allows for, you know, dissemination everywhere very, very quickly. Um, and, you know, you have a, uh, uh, Again, a small number of people spending a, realistically a small amount of time to create these assets and uh, to create these tools, which would then increase the exposure of that information um, across a, you know, what could be a, a very, very wide range of people. And then, of course, storytelling. So this is your traditional journalist role. You know, journalist sits in a town meeting, takes a bunch of notes, goes back, writes a story about it, and now instead of the 32 people that were at the town meeting, the 3,200 people in the town now understand because they read it at the local newspaper. And then, so the next meeting where they're actually gonna vote on it, 320 people showed up instead of 32, and then it did or did not pass because more people were informed. This is kinda like the idea behind the civic engagement and civic hacking. So, painted a picture of what it is to be a civic hacker or uh, what I have found to be uh, the definition of being a civic hacker. So who is doing the hacking? Who are these, these civic hackers and, and uh, humanitarian uh, evangelists? Um, Sunlight Foundation is a huge organization, uh, excuse me, was a huge organization that was very involved with civic hacking. They have significantly scroll, uh, um, cut back on uh, the number of people they employ, the projects they take on, and uh, unfortunately the funding for them has, I don't wanna say dried up, but reduced significantly. Uh, they were actually about to shut down right uh, before uh, the election results in 2016, and then they decided that that was not the best thing for America, so they started back up again. <laughs> um, but uh, and again, a much scaled down uh, scale, uh, reduced scale, excuse me. Uh, so Code for America, so it's actually Code for America, but it's actually Code for X, so it's like Code for Philly, Code for uh, Pittsburgh, Code for DC, and uh, Code for America is a pretty structured 
um, organization that they have a methodology of the way they go about things and solving problems. And uh, that is the kind of different than like your traditional hackathon or a um, motivated individual that will just show up to an event and say, I would like to work on X. They've identified fields and projects that they would like to work on and uh, move forward with those with uh, uh, talent resources. There is not a code for Rochester, at least uh, not at the time of writing this presentation, <laughs> uh, which was three or four days ago. So 18F, 18F has kind of got an interesting story. Uh, it started under the Obama administration not long after uh, the ACA rollout and the debacle behind healthcare.gov. The idea was let's get a bunch of smart people in the room and understand, you know, maybe we could have done this a little bit differently and spend a lot less money. Uh, that was like 20 to 50 people that were all kind of sitting around. Um, they very quickly identified what we'd like to do is take people out of industry and bring them into the government for a short scoped amount of time, 18, 24 months, and then put them back. And then you're not allowed to come back again. So the idea is that we don't want to change the trajectory of your career. We just would like to borrow some of your knowledge. Uh, 18F now employs over 2,000 people, and they uh, take on some very, very difficult uh, tasks. One of the things that they did recently in last year was they made every single government website on the federal level HTTPS instead of HTTP, which I can't even begin to understand the scope <laughs> of that. Uh, that's insane. But <laughs> so they do fall underneath the GSA, which is underneath the White House. So they do take their uh, direction from uh, the executive branch and the White House. So uh, some of the programs that they uh, were working on, they are not working on under the current administration. And now they're working on other things and, and vice versa. What's yeah? We are we're going on everything. All sites are going to be FTP now. It's great. <laughs> uh, yeah, you offline browsing. Uh, so, uh, Hacks Hackers, uh, which is another um, uh, uh, fairly new organization, uh, older than 18F. Uh, they uh, started in, I think, uh, yeah. So they started in 2009, West Coast. Some journalists and scientists, uh, computer scientists, got together and they said, you know. Right, computer scientists are really good at like ingesting and understanding these sets of problems, and journalists are really good at understanding and telling stories about these sets of problems. What can we do to bring these two people together to kind of bridge this gap? Technology is not stopping, and the complexity of technology is not being reduced at any point in the foreseeable future. And we need the storytellers of the world to be able to better use this technology and better understand the uh, technology to accurately and quickly tell stories. Uh, so there is slash was uh, a Rochester chapter of Hacks Hackers. <laughs> um, we were we were we were super uh, active for about three years, I'll say, um, and then uh, we had kids, and people had kids. Yeah, so <laughs> um, it will it will come back. <laughs> uh, so so their their uh, Hacks Hackers is um, it's neat. There are many chapters all over the world, and some of them are entirely journalists. Other ones are entirely hackers. Um, so hacks being storytellers, hackers being technologists. Uh, we in Rochester kind of very quickly became a very civic hacking oriented group. Uh, we were primarily sponsored by WXXI and we ran a few uh, pretty cool projects with them. Um, it's tough with this whole like, um, well, well, we'll go into that, right? So here are some of the projects. Uh, one of them is national, the other ones are local. So Motor City Mapping, so Detroit goes bankrupt. White House government, or uh, uh, Washington says, you have, it was something like very short, like 30 days to present us with a plan on how you're going to get out of bankruptcy with our money. So the, the uh, local leadership in Detroit comes up with a plan, and the concept of blight is not included at all in in the report. There is no plan at all how money is going to be spent for reducing or uh, affecting the blight in the city. So very cool hackers got together and they made this thing called Motor City Mapping. Uh, yeah, uh, Motor City Mapping, that, that is the makeloveland.com is the name of the company that sponsored this. It's Motor City Mapping is the actual URL. Uh, they actually made an app on an iPad, got people to volunteer with their iPads and mapped every single blighted property in the entire city in like seven days or something crazy like that by hand. And it was by, yes, go ahead. Blighted, so blight is a, um, uh, yeah, thank you. so it's a, a house that's like uh, abandoned, oh. right? So blight, right, so it's, um, and, and it's not necessarily just a house, it could be a property or another building, but 
primarily it was residential buildings, single or multifamily homes that had not been occupied. So what was the goal? So in many cases, uh, you want to knock those down okay. um, for various different reasons. The goal was to understand how many and where they were and how much money would be needed by the federal government to be given that so that at least it could be included in the budget. Um, whether or not the money was a, right, that's a government thing, but it's like you want to make sure you have all the information to the lawmakers so that they can uh, appropriately uh, uh, apply funds. So this was one of those, we have an idea, we have a very limited amount of time and money, let's execute it. And it used people that were techn technically savvy and not. Uh, so Rock the Hood is a kind of a cool uh, example of um, the city of Rochester put together a tool and released it and they used the technology that was proprietary and the service that they used was becoming not free and they didn't want to pay for it anymore. So Hacks Hackers worked with them to get the raw data out of it and a, a few students at RIT during uh, uh, Random Hacks of Kindness recreated it and is, uh, you know, uh, I don't know if it's actually hosted anymore. I know that this, the neighborhood data map, they said they were gonna come back with it and they never did. So this is the only, the only copy or version of it. Um, it has, um, uh, information uh, by uh, uh, census grid on everything from socioeconomic to number of people to race to age, everything you can imagine about the city. Um, very, very powerful and very important information for, for decision making in the private and public sector. Rock Report was a free and open source tool that allowed um, anyone to download it and uh, report things. It was done by RIT students as well. Uh, and the uh, idea here is that uh, we may, as we're driving through town, be like, why are these potholes still not fixed? And like your town supervisor literally may not know that because he doesn't drive that way to school or to work, right? Like that if they don't have the information, they can't fix it or they can't adjust it. Uh, Trefarious was one of the larger projects that we took on uh, at HackUp State that um, I think that was one of the, a good example of we had no idea what we didn't know. But uh, there was this um, uh, report that came out called Not In My Schoolyard, and it looked at the proximity of schools to high traffic roadways uh, and whether or not children were playing outside right next to you know, places where there are lots of hydrocarbons coming out. And so the, the original uh, Not In My Schoolyard was, uh, I actually don't remember where it was out of. I wanna say maybe Chicago. Um, anyway, they took a long time to compile all this data by hand. We were able to get a bunch of Department of Transportation information from New York State, and we made a real-time map, well, not a real-time map, but a, a browsable map where the red was high traffic, the purple was lesser high, but still high traffic, and then all the dots are where all the schools are, and we were, this is all just publicly available information, uh, and the yellow ones were the ones that were within the, per that paper that came out, uh, within like the concerned zone uh, of uh, the schools were very close to high traffic roadways. Um, you can click on them and get all this information. Yeller was um, a very large ambitious project that I would say uh, in my eyes was um, successful, however ran out of funding and then the champ person championing it at WXXI left to go to another paper. Um, but uh, Yeller was a uh, hyper-local community engagement app that was uh, anonymous and geocentric. So you could, on a map, see a dots of all the users, draw a square or a circle around a particular area, and send a question to all of the users that were in that area. So it could be very, very hyper-focused. Uh, so you have a one-block area and say, what do you think of the Quickie Mart you know, open drug market that is very clearly happening? What would you like to be done about that? and all the people in that area would get that question and no one else. Uh, you then would be able to read all the answers to um, questions and uh, what other people were posting. It was not only uh, question-based, you could free post. Uh, additionally, we spent a lot of time and focus on making it all anonymous. Um, we didn't keep logs or anything like that, uh, which there's all kinds of other technical challenges with that. But this was all open source and can be used by anyone. I will say that there's not a whole lot of good code at parts of that, but uh, um, that had an iOS app and an Android app and uh, server infrastructure. Um, so that was, uh, that was definitely very 
very cool and very neat. Um, we actually use WXXI servers for that instead of uh, AWS. But uh, yeah, again, that uh, that kind of died in 2015, I guess. Uh, Monroe Minutes is a uh, good example of taking something to 90% five times in a row. Um, <laughs> so uh, I wrote, uh, how am I doing on time? Am I Thank you. Uh, <laughs> so Monroe Minutes, the idea was to scrape the town and municipality websites for all of Monroe County in real time as quickly as possible to allow uh, notifications of any time a new document was posted, as well as uh, taking PDFs and other documents that are difficult to consume either by computers or humans and indexing them so they could be searched. Uh, an example was Henrietta uh, had this big, big to do about making it so you could have chickens in your yard. They were talking about it a lot. So you could type in chickens and then all of the town meeting minutes that came up that involved the word chickens, you could, you could then like view them. Uh, so there was two kind of neat pro uh, tools that came out of this project. Um, uh, one was IDDT, IDDT uh, which uh, the uh, Internet Document Discovery Tool uh, is essentially a really good denial of service attack tool if used incorrectly, but really it will go and search any website for any kind of document. So if you want all of the JPEGs, or if you want all the PDFs, or if you want all the doc, uh, Microsoft Word documents, whatever you want, it actually downloads a very small part of the beginning of the file, uses the meme or MIME type to identify it, and then uh, we'll keep track of all of the pages that it has gone, so it will only visit any page on a website once. So it's, uh, that's many iterations of that. It was previously the project called Bar Barking Owl. And the other one is YAPOT, which stands for yet, yet another PDF OCR tool, which will take a PDF, whether it is text or a scan, or if it's sideways, or if it's got dirt on it, clean it all up and turn it into text for you so that you can then take it and uh, ingest that into uh, something like Elasticsearch. Both of those are GPLv3 and open for anyone. Uh, Monroe Minutes did win second place in the AT&T Civic Apps Challenge in 2014. Uh, it is not currently up and running right now, though. It's on the to-do list. Uh, MC Safety Feed, uh, which some of you may have uh, visited, uh, is, is running right now. You can go to it. Uh, there are parts of the site that are not currently working, but this is a real-time feed of all non-violent 911 calls in Monroe County. So if you go to this website, you can get the uh, 911 calls that are coming in. It's about between 10 and 20% of actual phone calls. Um, and so you can see that it has the time, the, uh, the event that it was being called in, the address at which it is, and then the responding agency. So you can say that, um, you know, if there was a structure fire or something like that, uh, motor vehicle accidents, it's neat to watch the numbers go up uh, during like ice storms and, and snowstorms and stuff like that. So I do want to say for, for my, um, my career, I would say, and my uh, passion for free and open source software and civic hacking was very, very largely influenced by uh, the FOSBox, Fawcett Magic, previously Fawcett RIT, and uh, my time at uh, Hacks Hackers. Um, I think that uh, I, uh, without spending all this time on the side doing these fun projects and kind of like being in a safe area and safe zone of failure uh, to fail, you know, as, as much as I wanted to, if you will, uh, it made me a better developer in my career. Uh, I was like ending these with like, if you want to be a civic hacker too, you can. Here's some some ideas of project ideas. Uh, New York State VADAR data is like really interesting and Chris and I fiddled with that many a year ago, but uh, every year there's more data, which is neat. Uh, it's violent and disruptive incident report. And so you get to see things like um, uh, the number of bullying reports per year will change depending on who the superintendent is. So that's not really realistic. It's unlikely that the superintendent is influencing that at all. It's just influencing how they're being reported. So this is something that would be worth uh, noting on. Um, Monroe County election information, information all over the place. Uh, the mapping opiate addiction resources, that's a great example of like just collecting information. You don't have to be a civic hacker. You can simply just make a list. This is a list of all the resources for this. You can just do that on casually in your time and blast it out on Facebook. Like you're now a civic hacker. Uh, and then pothole reporting. Uh, I, I want to say that link is actually dead on the city of Rochester. It's supposed to be like a, you can click here and be like, oh, this is where the pothole is, but it's a terrible interface. And so this is me. Get a hold of me if you want to do some civic hacking stuff or just want to talk about civics. <laughs> Any questions? Comments, concerns? I, I'm getting a, to use Star Wars, I'm getting a, a, a 
like the Empire Strikes Back and that there's so much that's been lost that you had <laughs> that you need to. Can you just sum up again what's actually active right now and we can engage in sure. that's not dead? Sure. Or has its hand cut off? Yeah, 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 right, right, right. Yeah. Uh, so in the case of Motor City mapping, right, so that was like a, like a one-time goal, right? They did it and, and uh, uh, was done. Um, all of the rest of these that are on uh, this list, other than MC Safety Feed, uh, yeah, essentially are frozen in time. So these are, are projects that are no longer being developed. MC Safety Feed is running at least, but not uh, not currently being developed either. That uh, that was written like five years ago or so in PHP, and it's not so, that's not so like good. Right now, right? Yeah, yeah can right. come back yeah. someday, but we don't know when. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, go for it. Do you have any contacts or idea of similar um, activity going on in the security venue? Yeah, um, so uh, there, there, I want to say there actually still is a active Hacks Hackers group in Syracuse out of the iSchool. Dan, his name is, he's on Twitter, he's a professor there. Dan. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so it's Dan P A C H E C O. And yeah, I can, yeah, grab me afterwards and he would be a good person. The Not quite the equivalent of me. He's a uh, uh, more of a journalist than a technologist, but uh, he's got a good read on all that. Uh, so it was uh, <laughs> myself. <laughs> Uh, Something you can for. Yes, yes, right. Yeah. If you like to volunteer. Um, yeah, so uh, Chris Horn, myself, and uh, Matt Bernius were the three uh, three kind of. Yep. And then, uh, yeah, and then Matt Bernius and um, uh, Matt. Bernius. No, at, at WXXI. He went to Tennessee, and then now he's at the DNC. I would like to, yeah. I really would. I don't know about soon. Shortly, maybe. The great yeah. Perhaps. The great perhaps, yeah. Um, I think we, you know, we we benefited greatly from the FOSS box at RIT, uh, and you know, engaged and excited students, and uh, that was driven by um, a handful of individuals uh, at RIT that uh, aren't aren't either in the same roles or not here anymore. So you know, we've got to find find the right people to to re-energize the group. I think I'm out of time. Come find me if you want to chat. And look.